Uh, much of what I'm going to say, as I explained at the beginning of this, takes uh, its uh, origin from a very, uh, what I think is the best article in English on the contemplation to attain love by uh, Father Michael Buckley in the Way Supplement uh, from 1975. So it's, it's not a recent article, but it's, uh, I think, a, a profound piece. And so we're going to have, I wanted you to have the gist of it because I think what he says is good, but it needs to be unpacked, okay? Well, we begin with saying that the text of the exercises does not designate any particular place for the contemplation, sometimes referred to as the contemplatio, historically. There's been, therefore, some controversy about its interpretation and role within the exercises. In other words, since it's, Ignatius doesn't say exactly where it should come, some people have said, why can't you use it at the very beginning of the exercises or in the middle or wherever you want to use it as a guide or a director that it seems helpful? And that was true from the very beginning. If you look at the early directories, there was assemblage of hints, pastoral hints, on how to give the exercises. You have a difference among some of the very earliest Jesuits about where the contemplatio should go or could go. And some people say it's up to you, and some say, no, it really ought to be at the end of the exercises as a kind of climax. Well, in the article, Buckley, you'll see that, argues really that it really should be at the end of the exercises, that it really is a summary of the four weeks of the exercises, and therefore a kind of gateway to the return on the part of the one who has made the retreat to everyday life. But it is a disputed point. So if you hear of somebody as a fellow director saying, I like to give the contemplation to attain divine love at the very beginning of the spiritual exercises, that's an option. I think it's a wrong option, but it's an option, you know. But that's opinion. That's opinion. But just so you know that, and so that sometimes you'll be reading something and it, it will sound as if you can use it any way you want. And I suppose, like anything else, you can. And maybe for people who have made the whole spiritual exercises and are familiar with them, you, you might want to diversify it sometimes and use it at the very beginning. So it's what you feel pastorally is appropriate and can be adapted for the good of the one who's making the retreat. So you want to, you want to honor that there's a dynamic here that maybe yields its understanding if you see it at the end. But there's a pastoral accommodation, which is always yielding to the need or the help of the person you're working with. Okay? All right. Buckley says, beginning with line one, two, three, four, about five into this first paragraph, quoting Buckley, is it a method of prayer equally viable at any stage of religious development? Now, what does that phrase mean? He means, is it a prayer form? that you can use if you're a first week, second week, third week, or fourth week. So that means any stage of this religious development, whether you're going through a kind of purgation to be attentive as a creature before God to all the good that God has given, but to also all of the omissions, the spaces, uh, the X's in your performance with God, whatever, I, I don't like to put it that way, but that's, you get the idea or whether you're moving along into more intimacy with our Lord in the second week of the exercises. So that development where you are moving in your response and your exchange with our Lord. Okay, so it's a prayer form. Or is it a special kind of prayer form called a synthesis, a bringing together the dynamics, the movements of the spiritual exercises and therefore, as a synthesis, it's dependent for its efficacy upon the, the evolution that has gone before into a loving union with God. That's the issue. Is it just a prayer form, or is it a specific kind of prayer form that pushes the one making the retreat into a personal kinds of summary, effective summary, not just uh, linear and uh, mental, 
but religiously, psychologically attuned to what the movement has been. Now, notice again, when we've done this before, the terms that Buckley is using, development, synthesis, evolution. Now, I know Mike, and Mike's words are very important. What's the difference between that? those three, and it helps you in the exercises. A development, as we said before, development is like the psychological or the biological uh, paradigm that you can't move from one phase unless you finish the phase that necessarily starts. You can't get into intimacy if you don't have good identity. If you don't know who you are and you're falling in love with everybody, you're up a creek. You know, you can go bonkers. At the same time, if you're all worried about intimacy and there's only enough room in your life for that one other person, then you'll never move into generativity, which is the donation of yourself for something greater than the two of you in love. Uh, you, you need an earlier stage to move into a later stage. And if you jam a later stage into the life of people before they're ready for it, it can be chaotic. It can hurt them. huh? So you don't get a three-year-old and say, the time has come for you to tell you all the secrets of sex. You know, the kid has no way of putting that together. And to them, it's, it's gibberish, you know? Later on, they'll find it's adult gibberish, but it's still gibberish, huh? okay? So whether it's psychological or physical, it's one stage cannot preempt the growth that has to take place in an earlier stage. So you can't be a second week experience until you've had the first week experience, all right? So that's what he means by development. Uh, evolution, what does evolution add? It's also something that moves developmentally towards something which is better, more advanced, uh, more intelligent, intelligible, uh, more mature, uh, greater exercise of one's talents and energies so that you'll notice in the four weeks of the exercises when you come to the fourth week how little advice Ignatius gives about how to deal with the one making the retreat. Why? Because the evolution has been one of spiritual autonomy. The person begins to understand where he or she should be and needs less and less that kind of overt that is in direction that tells people what to do, and much more support, initiative, uh, a trusting of your instincts, because that's what you take away with you when you leave the retreat. An experience of your instincts before God are graced, and really God dealing with you is better than anyone else dealing with you. Annotation 15 is therefore an evolutionary reflection. You, you move to a more advanced state, of, if you want to put it that way, of life of the spirit. So the word development, psychological maturation, evolution means the movement that's organic to what it is to be a person led by the spirit. For Jesuits who are here, remember at the beginning of the Constitutions, and Ignatius says, the interior law of charity rather than any exterior law. So the presumption is that when you have turned your life over to God, you can trust the inner voice that tells you how you should pray, what you should do, uh, what really leads in your life towards what is wholesome and good, what leads away from that to what is divisive, uh, upsetting, disintegrating. Okay, those are, but they're important for people telling you what are the exercises and you read these things that, and they tell you all about the the traffic signals of the exercises, but they don't tell you about the evolution and the development of it, and that's what they really are. And thirdly, uh, a synthesis. And we know what a synthesis is. A synthesis means it's a syn, com, thesis, bringing the theses, the logical components together in a way in which those components form a whole greater than their parts a whole greater than their part. And you say, what does that mean? It means after a while you look back and you'd say, I understand what the first week means in terms of its literal presentation, 
better because I know what the fourth week is. And the fourth week illumines things in the first week I would not have thought about. Like God's love. You think of it maybe as a first week person, your vulnerability, your timidity, your sense of frustration, your sense of finding things you don't like about yourself, and then being told, despite all that, God gives me courage and care and uh, support, and God has a way of falling in love with losers. And the more I accept myself as a loser before God, the more I find myself a winner. And no one understands exactly what that means until you get into it. And you know that the paradox is the more that I understand the need of God, the more I appreciate what love is. That it's it's a lifting up and it's really an identification of me precisely where I most need God to enter into my life. Well, you're saying that you get a feel of looking back on that first week from the perspective of the fourth week that is a synthesis. It brings together in a different way what you did in the first week because now you see it in terms of the development and the evolution. The, the words make more sense now because they've been enriched by this ongoing experience. Okay. Last night I was talking with somebody and I said, what do you think the majus means? He said, well, I suppose it means more work, uh, more generosity, more giving. And I said, what if you think of it as a greater and greater capacity to allow God to enter into your life? That it's not as active only, it's passive. It's not only doing, it's also being able to receive, to receive. And then once you think of that, you think of the what we'll look at in this uh, final uh, prayer of the contemplation, take, Lord, and receive. Take, Lord, and receive. Take, and we'll talk about that later, but receive. You're saying, I want to enter into the divine passivity, which is God's abiding capacity to absorb. But to absorb not in dissolution, not destroying, but in synthesis, in making the created reality part of the divine reality. So anyway, I want to make a lot of them because it goes back to what we keep saying about the exercises that when you're talking with somebody, you'd say the exercises are a spiritual evolution, they are a spiritual development, they are a spiritual synthesis that allow a woman or man to move into greater and greater autonomy before the all-embracing love of God so that dependency and autonomy are harmonized. They can live together in peace. The lamb and the wolf lie down together. Okay? The lamb of our need and the wolf of our aggressivity become one in the union of God's love. You you read the scripture differently. All right. Then Buckley says, now, all of this goes into a loving union with God. Now, what the contemplation to attain divine love explores is, what do we mean when we talk about union with God? What, is that, what does that phrase mean? You say, well, it means that, that we're in God and God is in us. I say, okay, well, what does that mean? And what the contemplation explores are four ways of looking at what it is to be united with God, okay? So it's one of the major questions of the life in the Christian revelation of the life of the Spirit. The Father and I are one. What does that mean? And when you go back to John's Gospel, look how often Christ spells out what that means. Knowledge, love, work. And how in these sometimes unintelligible discourses that we get after Easter, which you feel like one day sounds like the day we just had before, Christ keeps seeming to say the same thing. The Father and I are one. The Father's in me and I am in the Father. And you will be in me as I am in the Father. And the Father will be in you. And you say, okay, I heard that. I heard it. I get it. But I don't know it. Well, this is an, oh, an effort to take that mystic language and to give it some kind of operational, some way of entering into that 
as having meaning for ourselves. Okay? And that's why it's so rich. He says there's another way of putting the same question. For Ignatius, the election, now remember what the election is, that is the cooperative decision that is grace and my own reflection on the movement of grace out of the history and the uh, special movements of this retreat. What is God asking me to be or to do? And if you recall, we said there are three ways of looking at the Ignatian election. It's a choice that I have the freedom to make about what I will do or what I will be in a radical way that defines my life. I will be a contemplative nun who will live on a mountaintop and I will feed the squirrels. Okay, that's an election. Kind of a dippy one, but it's an election, okay? All right. Or I will really be someone who will live as a single person, but I like to work directly with the poor because I feel that what God has asked me to be and to do. All right? And you, you see that as what is the concrete way my life has been leading me, okay? Or it can be not a choice of a basic life and lifestyle, but it can be uh, the correction of a lifestyle chosen, but I better it. I redirect it. I've been a mother and I've been a spouse, but I look more and more and I see that I've trivialized some of the best parts of what it is to be mother and spouse, and I would really like to redirect that in a way where I give my children freedom and I give my spouse support. And I realize that I've drifted away from that and our relationships have become functional. We get together at Christmas and Easter, but I suddenly realize that there's a lot of my life I want to change. Or I've been a bishop. And all my life has really been pushing ecclesiastical uh, uh, upward mobility. And I suddenly say, I don't want to live like that. I want to make decisions as pastor, as pastor, as pastor. Or I've been a politician and I've been the judge in the state Supreme Court. But now I know that God is asking me to go back and give that up and work directly as an advocate for pro bono work for the poor. I'm giving you three cases that are real. That's an election, that's a modification, a change, okay? So election that is a stance, an election that is a change. And the third one is an election that is a deepening, that basically I feel I'm doing what God has asked me to do, and I think I'm doing it as fairly well. I don't see any big changes, but I would like to deepen the meaning. I like to reaffirm. Uh, sometimes people will say, is it a good thing for people who have been married 50 years to repronounce their vows or is this as sentimental? And I said, no, if, it can be a wonderful experience of renewed grace, a deepening of affection and care after all those years of putting up with one another, you'd say, we do it again. Or Jesuits, and when I was in charge of tertianship, would say, well, what do the final vows give me that I didn't say once? Why do we have final vows? First vows were perpetual, weren't they? I said, yeah. But in final vows, you take proprietary care of that society of Jesus that took care of you. You pledge yourself to be a caretaker for the society of Jesus. That's different. It's a deepening of your affiliation. You mean I'm more of a Jesuit now than I was before? Yeah, you're more, what, evolutionarily developed in order to bring a synthesis of your life together in those final vows. Okay, so those, remember for the election, we mean those three things, direction of life, change of life, deepening of life. Okay, all right, that's, so he says, for Ignatius, this election demanded an antecedent maturity, that is, before you made the election, you had to be a free woman or man capable of making a choice, capable of responding to grace. Those two things I keep underscoring my autonomy and my dependency out of my autonomy on the companionship and guidance of God, okay? A freedom from deranged activities, okay? Disordered affections that we've talked about before. Not ordered, not oriented to love. And a sensitive identification with Christ, all the work of the second week. So Buckley is saying a tremendous amount 
in language that you can skip over, say, a student abstract until you start pulling it apart. And it's a wonderful way of bringing these dynamics of the spiritual exercises together. This religious liberty. Now, you know, think of words we look, phrases like religious liberty. He's just describing, what do we mean by libertas? What is libertas? Well, it does mean liberty, but it means liberty and disponibility. And we'll look at that later. Which emerged from the influence of God and a concentrated human cooperation. Keeps keeps hitting these two things again and again. Grace, autonomy. Grace, autonomy. Stood as a presumption <clears throat> of finding God in a decision. All right. Decision, election. Okay. Now, at this point in the retreat, the issue is, are these similar dispositions for entering into the contemplation for attaining love? Is the contemplation for attaining love more like the election and less than just another form of prayer. That's a crucial point. And Buckley is saying, I think it's right, it's, it, it's like the election. It's choosing, choosing consciously at the end of this retreat experience that I will be a lover by knowing how I am loved. Now, that's important. It means that I don't earn my love. I have been tutored in love. Tutored in love. And you think of the autobiography, that phrase of Ignatius, God treated him the way a schoolmaster treats a child. And think, well, yeah, he was docile. And it, it doesn't mean just that. It means God taught him how to teach. <laughs> I taught them how to help by being a helping God. <clears throat> there are parents who correct their children, and of course they're going to do what they should do. There are parents who are so attractive in the way in which they teach them how to drive a car because of the way they've driven, how they kept a house neat and clean, or how they've cooked. They learn by watching them do the good things that are acts of love, not be having their parents become foremen that make them do their duties. Now, you know, give and take. And sometimes you do want the kids to do their duties and you do act like a foreman because this, at this stage of their development, it's the only thing they understand. But you ought to know you're doing that and not think of that as being what it is to be a father or a mother. You, you see, that it, it's wonderful language. And people have read, I've given it to people who say, oh, I don't know what he's talking about. I said, well, he's talking about something that brings the whole dynamic of the exercise together in theologically rich and psychologically complex language. It's, it's a work of a very bright guy. Does it demand that one has progressed through the struggles and the graces of the four week of the exercises and now draws them into a unity? Or does it find a legitimate place at any stage of this development? Well, the answer is it's not just a prayer form. It really is a climactic bringing together of what has happened in the exercises. That's his point. The purpose of the contemplation was entirely a comprehension of all that had gone before. That means something of the first week, second week, third week, and fourth week enter into the dynamic of this contemplation to attain divine love and feeds its resonance. It carries it with a certain heaviness. A comprehension, that is, comprehend is come prandere, to bring things in, together in a way in which they are heavy with the meaning that they carry. When I was a kid in high school, we were taking the Aeneas, Aeneid, and you hear Aeneas say, sum pius Aeneas, I am, and we translate, I am pious Aeneas. <laughs> You know, you say, okay, we're translating it, we're getting through, and you can put that down. But as you become more and more aware of what this epic is and what that means, it means I am steadfast to what I've been called to be, and I can only learn what I've been called to be by doing the things that allow me to become what I should be. And you suddenly realize that that's different from just 
suddenly telling everybody, I want you to know that I really live a good life. <laughs> I'm pious. To saying, I am a work in progress and it's hard to do what I'm doing. And I wish that the gods had not called me to leave Troy and to found a new nation and to go through all this pain and all this anguish. But I'm going to stay there because otherwise I would be denying who I am. It's, it, it, it's, that's comprehension. And so when people look over the exercises, they come the fourth week and you say, all the things that were hard, the dryness, the difficulties, the moments of depression and desolation and sadness, and the moments of exaltation, the moments of insight, the moment in which you understand what God has been doing in your life, all of that is that rich experience that we've had together that makes the life of the Spirit. So discernment is not a tool to investigate. It's a revelation that opens up the rhythm of my life. And that's different. I was talking to a, a wonderful person last night, thinking of being a Jesuit. And again and again, I found him saying, well, people told me when I would talk to you that you would tell me. And I said, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm going to listen to what God has been doing in your life. You, if you're going to be a Jesuit, you're not going to be a Jesuit because I've swayed you in it because of some rhetorical device I have of lassoing you into the order. He said, well, how do you look at it? I said, I look at this as saying, I would love to have every good, young, because we're male order, male, who's got ambition and talent and energy and autonomy and all those good things. I would love to see him become a Jesuit. But I also am moved by the fact that not everybody can be, should be, or wants to be. And so I'm torn between a value that I want to share, but an autonomy that I always have to respect. And if I screw up with either one of these, I shouldn't be doing this job. So the two have to be held together. A value to share, but, it, and a, but a value I reverence, which is that person's freedom. Okay. And if preachers would remember that, they'd preach better. You have a value you want to share, but there's all that autonomy out there that you've got to respect. So how do you get around it? You tell stories, you give illustrations, you give poems. Because then people can dismiss it, but they know in general what you're talking about, and they begin to think of their story. At least you hope they will, huh? So the purpose of the contemplation was entirely a comprehension of all that had gone before. A comprehension is activity with a sharing of personal communion. Okay, you say, well, is that saying that phrase, whose activity, saying it all over again but another way? No, it's adding something. What is it? That that coming together has suddenly been a love story between God and me. Uh -huh. It's subtle like if you ever were a kid, you play this game where the little pieces of paper, you pick up a clue, it says, look under the bureau. And then run around, you look under the bureau, and there's another piece of paper, look under the bed. And you run under the bed, and then you pick up the paper, and it says, look in your dad's closet. You run to look in the closet, look around. And you find it and you said, all right, now look at his golf bag. And, you look, and finally, at the end, you find the treasure. Well, in a little way, there is an element of the searching for the treasure in the exercises. What is the pearl of great price for you? What is the seed that falls into the ground of your spirit and becomes a harvest? All that language of the hidden reality of the gospel that comes to some kind of growth because something becomes something you have experienced. You know? And that's why everybody's experience will be different in the exercise because their pearl of great price, their treasure in the field, um, their harvest, their haul of great fish, all those, those uh, images that we have in Scripture about finding what your occupation is. If you're a housewife and you found a whole bunch of fish in your bathtub, you would not rejoice. But if you're a fisherman and you get them in the ocean, you do. Why? Because of context. So contexts are going to be different for people. You know? If you, somebody says to you, we've dumped a lot of dirt in your living room and we're sorry, but somewhere in there there's a pearl of great price. You'd say, you know, screw the pearl. I don't, who's going to clean up all this stuff, huh? So you want to remember the context. 
the pearl is going to be different for the salesperson. The fish is going to be different for the fisherman. The harvest is going to be a different thing for the farmer. And gradually you say, what Christ is saying is that the kingdom and the treasure are going to be different for each one of us. And I said, that's right. So you have these ditzy questions like, when I die, am I going to be the best age I was in this life? I said, I don't know. But I think it will be whatever you've looked for that you would want to be, you'll be that. Why? Because that's your heart's desire. And that's what I think our Lord has promised is what? The fulfillment of what has been your heart's desire. Whether you're a fisherman, a farmer, a merchant, and so on. Okay? And the whole experience of the exercises has been parabolic, living out a parable of discovering what is that pearl of great price. Whatever it is, it finally tells you that I am loved. I am loved. When I was a little kid, what I wanted most was my own bicycle, you know. When I was a teenager, what I wanted most was enough money to go to the prom and buy the stuff I had to get. Uh, then when you get older, the, what I'd like to have, say I would like to have a collection of Mary Oliver's latest poems. Okay, you change. But each one of this becomes what? Something that's an emblem of my heart's desire something that I have value for. And at the end of the retreat, you're saying, what have you been looking for through this retreat? What, what suddenly has come together as your treasure? And what is God showing you it is? And some people say, you know, I know I've made an election and so on, but the biggest thing is that God is happy when I choose what I know will be really the best thing I can do with my life. And that's been so revelatory of me, therefore, that I don't have to perform before God. I have to surrender to the dream that God has shared with me, not imposed on me. Well, that's a great gift, isn't it, to have at the end of a retreat? So you'll find that the contemplation invites a person not only to see the id, the thing that they have promised, but also the environment of the promise, the, the culture of election. And that's what you finally want. Through the Jesuits here, in the Constitution, Ignatius always talks about pure intention. Okay, what is it? It's the way in which you move your life so that it is constantly in harmony with you know what God wants you to be and to do. And that means that when you then, as a Jesuit, you make your account of conscience, you allow your soul to be exposed to your superior, you can tell the superior where you are and you listen. What you're really looking for together, if he listens to you, is how God is leading you to enrich the gift of which you are a part, which is the communion of the society. All these things take on such a wonderful meaning, but... The temptation is to instrumentalize them so they become functions and not revelations. Okay? All right. Within a single person, there is the ecstatic union in which personal knowledge, love, and service become a total surrender. They become a way of giving yourself over to someone that you love. Within the universe, all things are finally understood as descending from God as gift, as holy, as sacred history, in its participations in the divine. Okay, now let's go through this. Descending from God as gift is the first movement of the contemplation to attain divine love, which is to see all of the communication from God as a gift. Something God did not have to do, but wanted to give to me. Like I always, when people say, thank you for this, you didn't have to do it. Of course, I always say, what a contradiction. Of course I didn't have to do it. That's why it's a gift. So, so don't say you're, not wor you're never worthy of a gift because it's freely given. But you can be appreciative of a gift which is freely received. So when you give a gift, you say, I don't want people to make me feel, if I, you know, I had an aunt, 
and she she gave you something. My mother said, for God's sake, get the thank you card out or whenever the end of it. So we wrote thank you cards just to get her off our backs. And I remember as a kid saying, I'm willing to do that because I know that means a lot to my mother, but I wish you would even send me a gift because it's such a chore to get out and say the right thing. And can she read this? Because she's looking for the lemon juice that I never wrote, what it's, so she, what I really meant by this or something. Anyway, you wish she kept her gift. All right. That's not how God gives. But God also, the second point, dwells. Okay, dwells. Now here you got to be careful. Remember, every time God abides, God makes holy by God's presence. The holy of holies that mark the Jewish festivals, huh? What did it mean? This is holy because God is there. So when they, the Jews still have this, this residual love of the land. Why? Not just because it's their possession, but because it's been possessed by the presence of God. So holy is what? God's stamp of presence. Take off your sandals, for this is holy ground, God says in Exodus to Moses. The bushes become holy. Why? Because I'm here. I'm here. It's almost as if there's a fragrance. The mystics will frequently talk about the fragrance of the divine. And what they're talking about is the inhabitation that God has in circumstances that create a whole different environment, fragrance, light, darkness. Okay? Well, that's that second point. The third point that Mike puts it this way is sacred history, the labor of working this out in time and space, which is our history. Revelation is God's communication, but the history of Revelation is the tedious task of working this out in language and symbols and cultures, all of which partialize something that's greater than they are, that is God's immense revelation, but what it means for us here and now. So when people get all excited, this guy that I, I can't stand, but guy on TV who's always making fun of religion, I forget his name, um, Bill Maher, and he always says, oh yeah, the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> All those animals came in. Yeah, well, who was cleaning up after? But so, he keeps saying, where do you start? You know, it's a story, Bill. <laughs> you know, it's not a literal presentation of the first celestial zoo. It's a story. <laughs> and for God's sake, take it as a story or you'll never understand. And everything in religion you can reduce to absurdity because it is absurd. Like every story is absurd. But like every story, there is a wisdom. There is an insight into what it is to be human and to accept the limitation of the human and to accept the fact that something greater than myself has found a way of talking to me in terms I can understand. I don't have any problem with that. You may have a problem with that, but don't reduce it to something that you can ridicule easily because there are a lot of smart people that can teach you how to read myth. And once you, you can make fun of any myth because every myth is vulnerable. I don't know whether it was ever, I guess there was a Betsy Ross. I don't know whether she said, shoot if you must, this old great hair and it's all the rest. But I do believe that there were people that loved our country from the very beginning and said, honor it, take care of it. And, and I want to be part of that myth. Take all away all of our myths, you take away all our dreams. Take away our dreams and then we live only as functionary for what we do, what we can have. Okay, anyway, but the point there is that third point of God laboring is God labors through the human to make the divine present. Okay? And participations in the divine, the fourth point, that God is both the beginning and the end. God is like sun that bursts out of the clouds and touches the gutter. And the glitter from the gutter absorbs and light back to its source so that there is an ebb and flow. Or like water from its source and water to its destination. 
Oh, yeah, I want to go on. Again. The merger of these two, of the surrender of man, sick means that he didn't put woman in too, but of the human person and of the descending creation of God as a unity in which the lover and beloved become one, integral in their mutual communication and commingled in personal communion. And to allow for this, the, the contemplation of vain event love resumes the principal themes of the four weeks of the exercises into a synthesis in which a person moves gradually to God as he is and for whom he surrenders himself in all things. So now you remember, I want to get into this. Um, the four points talk about God giving, God dwelling with the gift, God laboring within each gift to bring it to its unique own wholeness, and God being the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, God being the embrace, the embrace. Um, I just read something recently, someone was saying, when I think of death, I think of it as, and I say, I do not know where I will go, but I trust it will be in love. But I also know that I do not know really where I came from. I know that I was generated by my parents and I took flesh in my mother's womb, but the personhood of who I am, I do not know. There is a mystery before I got here. I've often thought about all the ancestors whose blood and psyche and nerves and reality, spiritual realities flowed into my parents and were transmitted to me. I had a mother, uh, I had a mother, of course I had a mother, but my mother's one younger brother, her name, his name was Lester, uh, died during the flu epidemic. And my grandmother used to say, you are so much like him. And I never knew him. I never even saw a picture of him. And they think one reason for that is my grandmother, and when he died, got rid of all the pictures. It was just too hard for her to bear, I guess. Uh, but I've often thought, there is somebody I don't know, I wish I knew, because I'm supposed to remind people of him. And so you always think as if you're living with a, a double somewhere, you know. But that mysterious before and that mysterious after. And to think of God as being the before and the after is what Ignatius gets at in that fourth point. Fourth point's hard to get across to people what it means, I think. Propositions. Ignatius sees all movement, a progress with a beginning and an end, an unfolding history, not atomic movements. Now, why is that important? It's the ability to look at your own narrative as a narrative, not just incidents, but revelations that have a greater meaning that are linked together. The, the grand sweep, and I don't mean, by grand sweep, I don't mean it's just big events. I mean that the events have a link to one another. They are gradually telling me about who I am, or where I came from. And so when you look at an old picture, I've, I've got pictures of myself and my sister, and, there's, and, and you see, I see some little things that even as a kid I was doing that I still do. And I realize it. Like, my, the little thing, but my sister's kids were forever coming in to wash their hands. If they would fall down, she said, you don't have to come in each time. But they did, and she said, there's something about our family that's fanatic about cleaning up, and it's true. We're always cleaning up. I don't know where it came from, but it's in your genes. Other people can say they don't want to particularly clean up. There's something in their genes about letting things be as they are, you know. And you say, well, there's just obsessions and they've been learned. I say, well, oh, I believe that. I think that you can learn. I also think that there are instincts that have simply been prenatal and are part of who we are. And you wonder where it came from when you say, I, I can just see it. I can just see it. This movement is developmental. I've talked about that enough. It's a growing of consciousness that Ignatius calls the center, interior knowledge, passing through stages called weeks. And the orientation of this knowledge is towards goodness with which God has surrounded the human person. Okay. 
Buckley has this phrase, one is taught to love only by being loved, and this pattern of ordinary experience repeats the most profound models of religion. You gotta unpack that. If somebody comes into a retreat and they have been wounded all their life by the withdrawal of love, the first week that is a lot of repair work. Knowing you are loved is not easy for someone who's not known much love. Or suddenly realize that, that the life that they got has always been grudgingly given only by the performance that you've been able to give that wins you the approval of the parental person. Okay. So some people hate school, not because of the drudgery, but because of the constant humiliation of being told they're not too smart. Maybe not always verbally, but in the grades they get, the things they don't succeed at. Think of how many kids' life was really twisted by the fact that they were autistic and nobody helped them know it, or dyslexics, huh? They didn't, nobody helped them understand. They didn't know how to read, couldn't read. And you uncovered that and suddenly realized that that an injury that was done was not simply the physical one, it was the emotional one, it was the status one, okay? All right. So the purpose of the contemplation is not contemplation simply, but a contemplation that transcends itself and moves into the decisions and directions of a man or woman's life. The unity of three movements, interior knowledge or realization, love or affectivity, and service or action. To know, to love, to serve. You said that from the second week of the exercises on. But they become an underlining, what? Paradigm of the dynamic of the Christian love, life. The Christian life is what? Revelatory. The Christian life is what? Affective. The Christian life is what? Self-donating. Or there's no Christian life. You unscrew any one of those three and you don't have the Christian experience. So people who, like, work very hard but never have known it as the fruit of love or the revelation or something that comes to them as a good in which they can participate because it tells them something about themselves. There's just so much. You can see there's so much as you go in here that gives you a background for this contemplation. Now, the structure for the contemplation 230 and 231, those are two very important comments. 230 says, it was good to note these things. First, love ought to find its expression in deeds rather than in words. That's been quoted again and again. I got a wonderful insight into this, the second reading for the Sunday of the Good Shepherd, in which Gregory the Great says, it is not faith that helps us to know the Lord, but love. And it is not obligation, but deeds. So acting out of love, you discover the love of God. Not acting out of saying, this is what we should do, but what we see, what we are doing as the completion of something that is good for us, and the good that we want to do as something that really is the way in which we express the good that we value. And so when you look at the whole ethical system that puts an emphasis on law or obligation instead of the developmental reality of the life of virtue, is screwed up because what it does, it begins to substitute for knowledge that is love, knowledge that is imposition. So when people ask, well, why is this true? They're asking a very fundamental question, meaning what does this mean for me? And how does it have resonance with what my whole experience has been? So when someone says, I don't understand the resurrection because I have no knowledge of it, they're saying something important. Okay? Now, each of the four points are power. Memory, the first, the gifts God given, effective in insight into what I remember, how this was an act of love, reflective analysis of how God works towards something, and surrender to the embrace of God. All right. 
I think I said enough about that. Um, I put down here that if you look at John 21, I think it's a very concrete uh, evangelical representation of the contemplation to attain divine love. And sometimes having people live with that is a good way of doing the contemplation. The gifts, all the things that Christ does on the seashore, calling them together, making the fire, having fish, having something to eat, dwelling with them, that all these are a sign that he dwells in those things which nourish us and give us warmth and give us companionship, the hospitality. Okay? And the third, that he labors. They wouldn't be there if he didn't work for them. And he ties all together what he did at the beginning, calling them, he does at the end, he recalls. The second call, okay? The take and receive. Now, they want, what I want to make most of here is everything I've been saying is expressed by Ignatius. Take, O Lord, and receive all my liberty. <coughs> is that freedom? No. It's the capacity to be generous, a magnanimity of spirit, it's a great gift we can give back to God. Doing what I do not have to do, but lovers do it. So it's the freedom to do what is the great deed. So is libertas, he talks about, give me, take all and receive all my liberty. My freedom, it's not exactly that. It's my capacity to do great things, to dream great dreams, to have great ambitions. It's about an energy to do something that will not be done unless I do it. And to realize that I have been called. And the importance in the whole Christian religious experience of the I. What is the favorite expression in John's Gospel, what Jesus begins his revelations with? Ego eimi, I am. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. I am the vine, you are the branches. I am. That identity that God pronounced in the burning bush, I am who am. And God has shared that assertion of self with us as the greatest gift we can give back to God. You who I am, I give you who I am. And you, I give it to you, not that it's despoiled or disintegrated or hoarded away, but that it's united, lifted up, embraced, rejoiced. And that's different. It's not the tyranny of the divine, but it is the union of the divine. And that's why the word union is so important for Ignatius. Now, my pastoral note finally is, uh, and I'm sorry it took too long, but there's so much stuff here that's rich. Um, it's too much stuff at once. People just are worn out. So I, in the fourth week, give the first point one day with other stuff, the second point another day, then the third point and the fourth point, and then maybe about the fourth day or fifth day of that, which is probably the last day for the fourth week, tell them to put it all together in some way, okay? Now, I gave you this, this little essay, Grace Notes, because I think, although it's about grace, grace is the gift of God, God's self-donation. It's a perfect example of the contemplation to attain divine love as a dynamic, as a movement, played out in this wonderful essay about the, um, the uh, omnipresence of grace in life and how we take it for granted. And there it is all around us. So I, it's a wonderful, wonderful essay, both in terms of its rhetoric and its theology. You can see that um, that contemplation to attain divine love, uh, you, you as a director, as a guide, want to go through it for yourself because it's just so rich and the things you can do with it are, are uh, multi, multiplex in their, uh, in their application. Okay, but I want any questions on clarification or Frank. Uh, could, could you elaborate a little bit on those last couple of points about take and receive? About take and receive? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> There's some 
question about whether you, at the end of each of these four points, do you say that over and over again, take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory. Some people say it's really only a prayer at the end of the first one. Some will say, no, it's at the end of the fourth. I, I don't worry about stuff like that. I'd say, do it if it helps you. As of course, then they'll say, well, how do I know whether it helps me or not? Good. And I said, well, you know, see if it makes you feel happy or good. Or, or if you feel you don't want to say it. Okay, that's the one thing, where you, when you do it. Then take, Lord, and receive. Take is not uh, raptus. Raptus is, you know what the word rape means, but raptus is, it's forceful snatching away. That's not what that means. Take means be gracious and accept, accepting who I am. Please be gracious to me. Please be gracious to me. <clears throat> You say, well, how do you know that that's what it means? Because it's so much attuned with what we know about the cultural makeup of Ignatius, where civility, uh, courtesy, uh, offering, for him, were not just cultural niceties, but they were imitations of the divine presence. The reverence that Ignatius talks about is an acknowledgement of how God has treated me. So why is that important? You say, well, because when any time you see any religious experience that's not reverence for the reality of people, God's not there. It's that it's not what a Christian should do. It just isn't. That this take is really graciously accept this reality that I'm giving to you. And realizing that I can say that with a reality that is limited, bruised, frequently capricious. You know, <clears throat> a little kid handing me the lima bean she doesn't want to eat at supper and saying, hey, Uncle Howard, it still is a gift. I might say, well, I will save it for later. <laughs> you know, especially since you've seen her take it out of her mouth. and not want to, you know. <laughs> But I think it's very important that you just don't go, ah, there's something that's going on in these things. Now, you don't have time to do all this psychologizing for every little thing. But it's an instinct, which is so important, that Ignatius has there. It's not a raptus. It's an acceptance, a gracious acceptance. Take And receive. Allow it to be integrated into the wholeness of who you are. What do we mean at the prayers when we say, through Christ our Lord? You say, well, it's a formula. And I say, but what's, what does it mean? We ask all this through Christ our Lord. We mean take it into the way Christ prays so that what I'm asking becomes what he's asking. Intercession, huh? That's different. It's, not, it's just not the way of ending the prayer. <laughs> I just can't. It's a way of entering into Christ because my spokesperson. You say, oh, you mean you mean he kind of forensic justice. Christ stands for. No, I, that's not Catholic. It's intrinsic. Christ becomes my prayer. That's the deal. And so when we say through Christ our Lord, we're really saying everything we do which is imperfect and self-seeking and nutsy sometimes, and I'm treating God like a slot machine, I'm hoping the right numbers come up so I hit the jackpot. All those things that we do in prayer, all of that in a sense is absorbed into the freshness and the integrity and the goodness of Christ. That's a wonderful thing that I'm praying. He becomes my spokesperson. That's receiving. Put it into your reality. Graciously accept who I am and put it into your reality so that it becomes transformed into all the goodness you are. You know? Live with that for a while. That's what every good poet does. They receive the reality and then they transform it into their vision. And in sharing that work with you, they ask you to be part of that poetic vision. And that's why, you know, you go, and I do the same thing too, but these, 
these speed tours that you go through. You see, look, look at that, Mona Lisa. Look this. Huh? Yeah, look. That's Da Vinci. Oh, yeah. And at the end, you say, I can't take it. I can't take it. I need an ice cream cone. <laughs> it was meant to stay with one or two things to take and receive. It's much closer to the aesthetic experience than it is to a moral, ethical imposition. It's revelatory. Okay? So he said, take, Lord, and receive what? My capacity to do great deeds, which I might not even know about. I might not even know how great it is. But it's that predisposition to do great deeds. Take, O Lord, receive all my liberty. Then you say, and my understanding, my memory, my entire will. In other words, all those realities that allow me to master time and space so that the imprint of the human as a spiritual reality can continue to mark our world. Take those things now and let them be fed with you. Take along and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, my entire will. Whatever I have, whatever I hold, whatever I have, okay, whatever I possess, res, those things of the principle and foundation and all other res things on the face of the earth, things that mark me who I am, and how they've impacted me, what I have and hold, what, what, what has become part of me. You know, how can I say it? If you live where I'm living long enough, you get used to coming down to a living room that looks like a hotel ballroom, okay? And so when people say, oh my God, it's so big, I say, yeah, I don't even think about that anymore. I go where I'm going, and that little corner becomes my, ha my habitat. I don't think about how big it is. I think of how can I reduce its size so that I can find a few friends to sit there and humanize it. Because you know? I'd be overwhelmed otherwise. Every time I'd come down, i feel as if I'm a floor manager at a department store you know? or the house detective. <laughs> Who's here and shouldn't be here? <laughs> the stranger at our desk. And I said, this is what God gave us, and this is where we are. But boy, they certainly weren't thinking of a home. But we can make it that way. We can make it that thing. That's, that's the have and to take all or receive all my little moment. Whatever I have or hold, those are rich words. What, what possessions that have left their imprint on me made me what I am. You've given it to me. So you suddenly realize providence. What is providence? The practical way in which God has, in which God has accompanied me in the historical details of my life. That's what it had been for Ignatius. It wasn't some overriding governing plan. That, you know, say, Did God know from the beginning that we were going to have meatballs tonight? I said, I don't know. I don't really care. But, well, I think God did. And if you don't think that, you're not a good Catholic. God knew every little thing. I said, oh, okay. all right. And if you don't think that, boy, am I writing you up? I said, no. I said, well, I'll tell you, I only think God's got more things to worry about than whether we have meatballs. But I think in a general sense, God wanted us to be fed. God wanted us to feel good about what we ate. I think God wants us to be nurtured. God wants us to be healthy. Those things I really believe. But I don't think God cares whether we had meatballs tonight or pork sausages, uh, you know. Well, yeah, I said, I think God knew we were going to have meatballs. But do I think that for all eternity, God was obsessed with whether we were going to have meatballs tonight? No. And I think we're spending so much time on crazy stuff like this. I just think it doesn't make sense. But that mechanistic idea that God doesn't know anything unless God knows all the details that we have determined. I said, I don't. Though you mean that God didn't know it. I said, I don't think God cares about it, is what I'm saying. And you have that experience in your own life when you get people who are fussy, and they say, well, do you think? I said, I don't care that much. I really don't care that much. I don't think it's a big deal, you know? And I think to be obsessed with the details is to be obsessed. To be obsessed with big things is to be dedicated. So the line between dedication and obsession is always pretty thin, <laughs> you know? So a lot of dedicated people are just nutsy about the right things, you know, and you can get that way.
So take, O oh Lord, receive, O oh, I liberty, my understanding, my time. Whatever I have or hold, you've given it to me, and I surrender to you to be governed by your will. I want it to be governed by your will. It doesn't mean God is going to impose on me something I really don't want to do, but it's God's will. That can happen. But God's will is basically the loving determination that whatever is will work towards what is the good for the fulfillment of creation. What we've said all along, the fulfillment of creation. Now, can that sometimes mean deprivation? Yeah, in all of our lives, it sometimes can mean an immediate deprivation. We don't take care of our earth the way we should, deprive ourselves of some mobilities, some luxuries, and we're not going to have any earth left. And that's going to be a hard message to get across because we have not been a people who live well with voluntary deprivation. We just don't. Impose deprivation, yeah, but not voluntary, not too well. So you're going to have to have a conversion of our minds for this, a, a deep religious conversion. So that's what that means when you unpack it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, Howard, uh, this is um, maybe, uh, it's not trivial, but it's uh, compared with what you've been talking about, uh, less uh, uh, profound maybe. But um, I've run into situations where um, the contemplatio, the language, you that Saint Ignatius uses is not easy language, no. and how do how what are you, what are your thoughts about how we uh, uh, when you when you give the uh, contemplatio um, ways of uh, um, uh, passing it to the person to pray to pray over? Yeah, and you're right. I know what you mean. That's why I suggested that that John twenty one that you have the dynamic of the contemplation to attain divine love in that scene of Jesus at the Sea of Tiberias. All the movements are there. And you say, I'd say, pray over this as a scriptural presentation of what Ignatius is talking about at the end of the retreat of all the ways in which Christ represents the donating God who dwells within his gifts as labor to bring them so that they are available to us and reinforces the idea that where we begin, there we end, it's all brought into divine embrace. Jean Venet, the great Canadian figure who has done so much with the uh, people who are uh, handicapped folks, has a wonderful essay called The Second Call, and he said John 21 represents the ongoing call that is part of Christian experience, that God doesn't call us once, but God calls us again and again and again and again. And that's that fourth point, that God who has begun is God that will end. Um, and we're always being called to a renewal and to a completion that are uh, that is going to be in the hands of God in one way or the other. And I, you know, you do feel that. Sometimes you have this thing, I'm doing things, I'm still learning the things I thought I should have learned a long time ago and I didn't. And then I realized maybe that's the way it's always going to be, that this is an area of limit and weakness and sinfulness that I'm simply not going to get rid of. It's, it's here, and I'm not complacent about it because it bothers me. I wish I didn't have it, but I'm not tormented by it because I'm, I'm pretty much an unfinished work that God's going to have to finish. That's the deal. And if it isn't, and if I've made a mistake, too bad. There's nothing I can do about it now. But that would mean that everything else I've gambled on mercy, love, understanding, forbearance, goodness, has been a sham too. And I don't believe that. You know, you don't. Believe, I don't mean. I make it all sound like I'm greatly like you know. I'm the little flower, you know, or something. I don't feel that way. I feel that a lot of it is struggle stuff. But I really do believe that you surrender your doubts to the sureness of God's presence. That's all you can do. You know? So I might talk like that with people. You say, you know, as you come to the end of the retreat, you might say, 
well, I don't feel more, some of these people say, I don't feel any more perfect. I don't feel like there's been this great transformation. I have more ideas. I prayed more. I think I've done good things, and I see things a little differently. And, and I said, well, you won't know that till you keep living your life, and God will keep bringing reality to you. Well, if you think of the exercises as being a program for moral betterment, they're always going to be disappointing. If you're going to think of them as a strategy for ongoing revelation, then they'll be very enriching for you. So when people, you know, I've said this to you again and again and again, and I know it's hard to get, but the betrayal of the exercises is to make them an exercise in moral betterment. I, they're not that. They're not moral betterment. They are reading an invitation to ongoing revelation, to finding God in all things, which is revelatory. Seeing things differently, seeing them with more dimension, seeing them with freshness. Hearing, you know. It's like people telling you, I said, would you like to go to the symphony? Well, what's, what are they playing tonight? Beethoven's Fifth. Oh, I heard it. Okay, you know, remind me to change my hair lotion or something. You know, if, novelty is not. It's the familiarity that deepens because you see things you didn't see before. You know, or would you like to meet somebody? Well, oh, I was. I I met them. I said, well, I know, but did you deepen the relationship, get to know it better, and? Or a good movie, you know. I remember we show because I would use movies and the exercises in a course, and kids would say, "Father, how much? Why do you know so much about this movie?" I said, "Because about the eighth time I've seen it." Oh God, eight times the same movie. I said, "Yeah, but it's a good movie, and you find things you didn't find before." <laughs> well, kids don't, you know, their idea is to watch Boofus and somebody else become jackass or. You know. <laughs> Once you've seen it, you've exhausted its richness. But the idea, why would you want to watch The Magnificent Ambersons three times? Because I find things in it I didn't find before and see things I didn't see before. And that's fascinating, you know? So the exercises are, are not a mechanical methodology for being a better person. They are a revelatory invitation to being a more observant person. And then they'll say, well, how is that a conversion? I said, then you have to go back to Lonergan's idea of conversion, which is not just moral betterment, but seeing life in a new way, seeing dimensions you haven't seen before. How can, you know how you suddenly realize that, and this is what, it, when I went and lived for a year in East Asia, it was so good for me, it really was. I'm not a good linguist, and so I didn't have a hold of the language. But I began to realize what it is to be an American is not the paradigm for what it is to be human. It's just one small parcel of that marvelous tableau of the human race. And I, I, that's all I can say. And that, that left a big impression on me, that the way we do things is just one way. But there's a Korean way, there's a Chinese way, there's a Filipino way, and each of these has got a little twist that's different. And it's that mosaic that begins to give me an understanding of what it is to be human. And so when people say, we must be tolerant, I say, well, okay, if that means that basically you really feel you're better than everybody else, but you're slumming by accepting them as being part of this great human family, it just, it's not real. Now, I don't mean I don't do it. I still correct myself all the time about, about this. But it's when you have the breakthrough that the revelation is that my possession of humanity is only one small mosaic, part of a mosaic of what it is to be human. And that's liberating. We don't bear the burden in the United States of America of having to be the strongest. We just have to be strong in the way God wants us to be strong, which is not the way God wants Switzerland to be strong or Luxembourg. And you come then with reverence for the way in which they can reveal to you something of their human strength that you don't see otherwise. Now, that's what I think the exercises should really do is this humble revelation 
of the ongoing unfolding of the magnificence of God's panorama of who we are and who God is, so that you're never finished with it, never finished with it. So I think in the take and receive, you know, I, I, I would use then, Gap, I would use some of the parables that people have taken always as, you know, the treasure in the field, the harvest is great, the hall of great fish, and, and say, live with the parable and not the moralizing that frequently enough the scripture has added onto it, but what was probably the original saying of Jesus was the story told and realize it's talking about every fish is not the same. Some are cute fish and some are big fat fish and some are fish to eat and some are fish to use for bait. They're different, you know. And to, to stay with the great hall is multifarious in who it is and say, think of that. So re renew a lot of things we've done. Take the Good Samaritan parable and read it now in the light of, the, of this contemplation to attain divine love. What's the gift? And where does a Samaritan dwell in the gift? What does that mean? He dwells in them. They are his oil. They are his bandages. They are his uh, wine of disinfectant. They are his beast of burden. They are his money. They all represent He was dwelling with them, and he's giving them away. Huh? And he labors. He lifted up this person. He took care of this person. And then he leaves, but he says he'll come back. So he begins this work of mercy, and he will come back and end this work of mercy. So it's a wonderful paradigm that you can tease into a recapitulation of almost everything that you touch in the revelation of our Lord. So there's no way in which you cannot bring to life things that people have seen on one level now as a new dynamic of the way we love. And I was thinking the other day, you know, how you're not particularly, you're not pursuing it, but out of nowhere I was coming back from, um, I don't know, went down to um, M Street for something to come back, and I said, you know, this way is, this is what it is. To, it's not that you do these things to show that you come to know love. It's what love is. Love really is giving and dwelling and helping and abiding, accompanying a person from the beginning of something to the end. That's really what it is to love. And when those things are there, I, I, I know that these are ways of looking concretely at whether I love somebody. What do I give? And does this really symbolize something that's I want to be part of me to that person? And am I, am I working along to help this person become what he or she ought to be? And are they helping me? And the accompaniment, you know. I, when, my, when, I've spent this, when my mother was dying, I remember my sister saying, There's not, isn't there something we can do? And I said, no, we can be here. She was here for us before we even came. And now we're being with her as she goes out. That's all she asks of us. It's a return for what she did for us. And she said, and that helped us, you know. And she said, I wonder if mom knows. I said, yeah, in the deeper, deeper ways of human consciousness, I trust that she will know. That's, that's important for us. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.